And welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. Our discussion tonight will focus on a critical foreign policy issue, the nature of the rift between Iran and Saudi Arabia, its impact on Middle East politics, and its implications for American diplomacy. Dr. Megan Sullivan is our moderator this evening, and it is always a pleasure to introduce a former IOP fellow. So welcome. Dr. Sullivan is a Middle East expert in the development of U.S. strategic policy for the region, as well as for other countries in times of crises. Her advice is sought and valued at the highest levels of government. In her career as a senior foreign policy strategist, during which she earned the highest honors for civilian service at both the State Department and Pentagon. Professor O'Sullivan served as vice chair of the all-party talks in Northern Ireland in 2013. She was special assistant to President George W. Bush and deputy national security advisor for Iraq and Afghanistan, helping run policy reviews for those countries. Dr. Sullivan served in Iraq in 2008 to help shape the security and the strategic framework agreements between the U.S. and, and, and Iraq. More career highlights include serving as the NSC Director for Strategic Planning in Southwest Asia and advising the Administrator of the Coalition Provisional Authority in Baghdad. She is a prolific author of books and articles on American foreign policy. She's also a columnist for Bloomberg View and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, and the Absent Strategy Group. She now serves as a Jean Kirkpatrick Professor of Practice of International Affairs, a member of the board of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs here at the Kennedy School. I must admit to leaving out a good deal of Dr. Sullivan's experience and accomplishments as a foreign policy leader, so I may move more quickly to have the privilege of presenting Dr. Megan O'Sullivan. Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much, Maggie. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us here uh, for an event which I think will prove to be interesting and memorable. Um, I personally have just returned from the region. I just spent two weeks in the Middle East and a week of that in Saudi Arabia, and I can say that this question of the relationship or the competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia um, really animates so much of the discussion happening in so many parts of the region. And I would say that it's not all negative. Um, one place that I visited with some of my colleagues here was Israel. And in Israel, there was some sense that this dynamic has created some strategic opportunities for the country of Israel. But then on the other hand, in other parts of the Arab world, you find that people feel that this competition is not being appreciated by Washington and the United States, and that the focus on Iran um, is not being understood as a driving factor, and therefore you feel a growing, uh, a growing gap between the United States and some of its more traditional Arab partners. So again, this issue that we're going to discuss tonight is animating these conversations, strategy, um, and uh, expectations. And tonight we have two fantastic people with us to discuss this problem from a uh, real depth of expertise. Um, we have Bernard Haeckel, who is a professor of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. He's also the director of the Institution for Trans-Regional Study of Contemporary Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. Um, Bernard writes on a wide variety of issues related to our conversation tonight. He writes about Islam, about politics, about history, uh, informed by philosophy, uh, geography, all types of issues. But I would say one of the areas that so many people go to him for is his expertise on Saudi Arabia. So we're very glad to have him with us tonight. We're also very pleased to have Kareem Sajapur immediately to my left. And Kareem is a senior associate for the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, 
uh, Kareem before coming to the Carnegie Center several years ago was with the International Crisis Group in Tehran and Washington. Um, this is an organization that I direct many of my students to. As many of you know, it's an organization that does fantastic work, which is policy-oriented, um, but very, very informed by facts on the ground. So in this capacity, as current capacity, as previous capacity, Kareem um, actually met, got to know, spent time with many officials all over the Middle East, but particularly um, in the context of Iran. So you can see why these two gentlemen uh, have been asked tonight here to discuss this pressing foreign policy issue, which is the competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And what I thought I would do is give our guests an opportunity to open up by presenting two different perspectives. Um, because of course there are many different perspectives, but um, I want to ask first Bernard to pr uh, present the perspective from the Saudi view of this competition between these two powers. What are the source, what's the source of this competition? And I'll ask Kareem to follow, giving us a more Iranian view. So thank you both again, and Bernard, over to you. Thank you, thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. So I'm going to try to present the Saudi perspective on Iran. Uh, the Saudis, when looking at Iran, uh, I think think first of the period before the revolution when the Shah ruled Iran and when um, Iran was a very close ally of the United States and it was the dominant power, military and political power in the region. And then the revolution happened and you uh, have a new regime that is um, revolutionary, that seeks to export its ideology, which is an ideology that is rooted in a particular interpretation of Shia Islam uh, and that this ideology is inimical to Saudi Arabia, to the ruling family of Saudi Arabia, to the regime as it's constituted in Saudi Arabia, and that, the, and that the Iranians have constantly been a power that has used non-state actors, terror, uh, terrorist groups to project its, their, the influence of Tehran throughout the region. More recently, and as a result of the 2003 US invasion of Iraq, Iran has taken advantage of that situation by dominating Iraq. It also controls um, a good part of the uh, Assad regime in Syria. It has very powerful control and domination over Lebanon. And even more recently, it has developed strong ties and links to Yemen, uh, where it has allied itself with the Houthis. So from the Saudi perspective, they look at Iran and they see a noose that is forming all around the kingdom uh, with the Iranians using primarily non-state actors to project influence and power, and it, that it's a destabilizing force, Iran that is, uh, and that it is one that is now being rewarded by the United States, uh, despite the fact that it's this revolutionary destabilizing force, and the Saudis don't like this at all, and see, uh, see, have a deep desire to roll back Iranian influence from the entire Arab world. Now that's a big ambition. I doubt they can accomplish that, but that is the Saudi view uh, as, as I understand it. So just um, before we go to Kareem, so obviously you included both sectarian and geopolitical explanations in your overall narrative. Would you say one is more dominant than the other in, from the Saudi perspective? So m my reading actually of both countries, I don't know whether Kareem agrees with me, is that the competition is primarily geopolitical, but that this competition gets couched or masked in sectarian language. So when, for the Saudis, uh, when they look at Iran, they see Iran using these non-state actors. All of them, almost all of them, with the exception of a few Palestinians, are Shiites. Um, and, and from the Saudi perspective, again, to depict the Iranians as a Shiite imperial power uh, plays well to their own base of supporters. So the sectarian, the sectarian language or the framing of the problem in sectarian terms um, is very useful. Uh, from, for understanding the problem and also for mobilizing resources against the problem from the Saudi perspective. And you said, don't worry, I'm gonna come no, and pepper you with questions. You said that um, the Shia ideology was inimical to the, the Saudi regime. Could you say a little bit more? Because not everyone in here may have a full understanding of the difference between the Sunni and the Shia um, right. ideology. So, so, so the Iranian, the Islamic Re uh, Republic of Iran is founded on a doctrine called the doctrine of the guardian of the, the guardianship of the jurist, Wilad Faqih. 
This is a particular interpretation of Shi'ism that Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, um, uh, developed uh, from, the 19, from 1970. And this, this, this is a revolutionary ideology uh, that argues that a jurist, a religious scholar, uh, is ultimately the ruler of not just Iran, but of the entire Muslim world. And that uh, and Khomeini was that scholar, and now Khamenei is that scholar, the supreme leader of Iran. And so um, the Saudis, and, and this scholar, whether it's Khomeini or Khamenei, ha have, often have often used this ideology uh, to project their influence. So for instance, let's take the example of Hezbollah in Lebanon. To be a member, a fighting member of Hezbollah in Lebanon, you have to believe in this ideology. Um, so, so the Saudi, and, and, and also the Iranians have used this, their followers to foment uh, demonstrations at, in Mecca during the Hajj on multiple occasions. Uh, the Nimr and Nimr, the cleric that the Saudis just executed, was an adherent to this ideology. So for them, this is a, a, a way of interpreting Islam from the Saudi perspective. This is a way of interpreting Islam that basically puts Iran in the driver's seat, not only of the region, but actually of the entire Muslim world. Okay, thank you very much for that. And Kareem, turning to you, um, and I might ask you also, maybe before you present the Iranian perspective, just comment on the ideological piece that Bernard uh, just elucidated. Because Bernard, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing from you is that what the Saudis object to is the ideology of marrying this, this religion with governance, this mode of government which is different than finding Shiism as a doctrinal uh, issue being incompatible. It's, it's the Vlad e Faki that is a, a problem from the Saudi perspective, which is not the same thing as being a Shia. That's so, correct. Yeah, that's I correct. Just In fact, the Saudis don't generally have problems with the other form of Shiism, which is a quietist form that shuns politics on principle. Right. Right, which is the Ayatollah Sistani Correct. in Iraq. Correct, that's the Ayatollah Sistani yeah. model. Okay, great. Before we dig too much in, uh, further in that direction, Kareem, uh, if you want to comment on that, that distinction, governance and religion, um, and then if you could give us the Iranian perspective of this competition. Sure. For, first, it's really an honor to be here. I see a lot of friendly faces, too numerous to, to name, and Bernie actually was the first one to take me with him to Saudi Arabia about 10 years ago, so he's my, my marja in all matters uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. <laughs> Um, you know, I always tell people that, well, first let me take a step back, there's an African proverb I love which I think nicely captures the Iran-Saudi conflict which says, when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And we see that you look at the most bloody conflicts in today's Middle East, they all, almost all of them have elements of this Iran-Saudi conflict. And um, I would say there's three parts to it, obviously sectarian, Sunni, Saudi Arabia versus Shiite, Iran, ethnic, Persian, Iran, Sunni, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. and, and geopolitical. And because we're here at the house that Joe Nye built, uh, the, the way I've been thinking about it is that this, the, the ethnic and sectarian aspects are the, uh, is the soft conflict between the two countries. You know, they're, they're always going to be um, different in that respect. They're always going to be rivals, competitors, the same way that France and Germany are rivals and competitors. China and Japan, Brazil and Argentina, that's always going to exist. But it doesn't always have to uh, manifest itself in these bloody conflicts. And so the geopolitical uh, is, is the hard conflict between the two sides. And when that is activated, it, it, it's very dangerous because it, it, it activates the, 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 these two soft conflicts, the sectarian and ethnic. And to the outside world, it's, it's then perceived as these primordial, primordial conflicts, as, right. as President Obama referred to it in his State of the Union speech. And you know, when you read the Iranian press, it's, it, there's this um, kind of unvarnished Persian chauvinism you, you, you read. And, and I've noticed this not even among the hardline Iranian press, but among very sophisticated Iranian uh, uh, diaspora, the way they talk about Gulf Arab Saudis in particular. Um, and likewise, among very educated Saudis, you hear the way they talk about um, Shiites. Um, and you know, the, 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 the paradox is that I think that um, you know, the, the, the Persians, as I said, they feel this cultural chauvinism towards, towards uh, uh, Gulf Arabs. Um, I think the, 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 
the, the Gulf Arab Sunnis um, have a, a certain chauvinism um, towards, the, towards the Shiites. And I think the reality is as long as these regional conflicts um, continue to, to, to go on, um, it's going to be very difficult to, to reach some type of a modus vivendi between the two countries. I guess there's, there's two ways of thinking about it, which is, um, is it the Iran-Saudi conflict or the Iran-Saudi rivalry which has ignited these regional conflicts, or is it the regional conflicts which has exacerbated the tension between Iran and Saudi Arabia? And I, and I would argue it's, it's the latter, not the former. If we were in Tehran sitting down with um, the supreme leader in asking him about Iran's relationship or lack thereof with Saudi Arabia, how would he explain it? We heard from Bernard, you know, the perception from the Saudis. How would um, a senior Iranian official or the supreme leader describe Saudi Arabia to us? Well, one document I'd recommend to all of you is the last will and testament of the Ayatollah Khomeini, which was written when Khomeini passed in 88, 89. And what's remarkable about that document is the greatest vitriol he reserves is not towards Israel or towards the United States, but towards Saudi Arabia. And I think the supreme leader, I, I describe him as a, a strict constructionist. He's someone who is very loyal to Ayatollah Khomeini's worldview, to loyal to the ideals of the revolution. And what are the ideals of the revolution, um, if you want to distill it down to its essence, at least in foreign policy? I would describe it as um, uh, objection to Israel's existence, um, objection to quote unquote US hegemony and that rivalry with Saudi Arabia. And um, the, the way he talks about Saudi Arabia is very different than the way that someone like Rouhani or Rafsanjani thinks about Saudi Arabia. It's much more, um, you know, it's, it's, it's much more deep seated. The, he sees uh, Saudi Arabia as essentially a pawn of, of the United States. And he would argue that um, ISIS is a, a, a byproduct of uh, Saudi ideology and, and, and Saudi uh, financial largesse. So there would be that same argument that um, Saudi Arabia is destabilizing the region, but through other means. Absolutely, and I think this is, uh, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, I think that this is one of the great challenges when we're trying to counter ISIS, and I know this is something that Secretary Kerry has focused on a lot to try to bring the Iranians and Saudis to work together to resolve the Syria conflict and counter ISIS, because they, they fundamentally diagnose, the two sides fundamentally diagnose the problem differently. To the Saudis, they'll say that um, ISIS is a, is a byproduct of um, Assad brutality in Syria and Maliki brutality in Iraq, which is, um, you know, Iran is responsible for. And as I said, the Iranians will say it's, um, it's, it's Gulf financial support and, and Wahhabi ideology. Yeah, great, thank you. Before we get into, uh, the effects of the competition. Let's spend a little bit more time just talking about the nature of the competition. And uh, Bernard, you, you mentioned that this really goes back to the time of the Iranian Revolution. So we're talking about you know, more, than, more than 30 years. Um, I remember when I was living in South Asia in the early and mid 90s, I would come across sort of remote Muslim areas in South Asia and there would be mosques and Muslim centers that were funded by Iranians and Saudis. So, you know, this has been going on outside even the borders of the Middle East for quite some time. Um, is, it, is this competition intensifying today? Does it just seem more intense because we're more in tune with it? Or are there some factors which are really driving this to a type of crescendo? I'll start with Bernard, but uh, Kareem, feel free to jump yeah. in. No, I think it's much more intense than it, than, than it has ever been. I mean, they did break uh, diplomatic relations after the revolution, and I think they only reinstituted them. When was it again that they had the... the uh, Rafsanjani. Yeah, so, so, so for a long time, you know, they didn't, have, uh, they didn't have diplomatic relations. But more recently, I think the Saudis have been really unnerved by the fact that Iraq was handed on a silver platter, to quote the former... Uh, uh, and late foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, Saud al-Faisal, who, who basically warned the Americans before the invasion that this is what would happen, and this is effectively what, what has happened. So that, that really, uh, I think, seriously unnerved the Saudis. The other is the Obama overture to Iran and that led to the, to the nuclear agreement. 
Um, you know, the, the king of Saudi Arabia is someone who is now about 80 years old. He remembers a time when the big friend and ally of the United States was Iran. And since the revolution, the big friend and ally of the United States has been Saudi Arabia. And he does not want to go back to a time when Iran uh, becomes again the, the, the big sort of strong policeman of the United States, especially as the United States is retreating from the region or at least claiming to retreat from the region, pivoting towards the east and that sort of thing. So I think the Saudis really are um, very, very worried and have ratcheted up the, the tenor and the, the, the intensity of the conflict and the, the tension with the Iranians. Um, I think as a result of what's happened in, in Iraq first, and more recently the agreement, the nuclear agreement. And you can see this uh, ratcheting of the tension in Lebanon. For instance, mm -hmm. today, right. or I think just a couple of days ago, yeah. the Saudis decided you know, they were going to stop paying um, a, a promise to, the Lebanese to, to fund and arm the Lebanese army uh, because the Lebanese chose not to side with the Saudis by condemning the burning of the uh, Saudi embassy uh, and, and Saudi consulate in Iran. You know, um, so I think Bernie is absolutely right. And during the 80s, uh, the Saudi Arabia and Iran had a very acrimonious relationship because Saudi Arabia was essentially bankrolling Saddam Hussein during the Iran-Iraq War. During the 90s, when there wasn't tremendous amount of regional uh, turmoil, everything's relative. In the Middle East, there was, there was a, a Gulf War, first Gulf War, but uh, um, the two sides had a you know, they had kind of a, a cold modus vivendi between them. As I said, uh, Hashimi Rafsanjani is someone who um, believed in that rapprochement with the Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia. Um, and, and now as a result of these conflicts, I think that's really what's exacerbated things. But going back to the first question you asked Bernie about um, who wants which conflict? I, I would say that if you're Saudi Arabia um, and you're in a region which is, what, 80, 85% Sunni, the sectarian conflict is the one you want. Um, and if you're Iran, you don't want the sectarian conflict. You know, if you're waving a Shiite Persian flag in a region which is 80, 85% Sunni Arab, you're not gonna win a lot of followers. So the conflict you want is the ideological conflict to, to um, you know, anti-imperialism, anti-Israel, um, anti-United States. And I think that this Syria war has really been bad news for Iran in that Sunni Arab world on a daily basis sees that you have an Alawite dictator uh, armed and funded by Iran that's b barrel bombing Sunni Arabs on a daily basis. So Iran has paid a huge reputational cost as a result of the Syria war. I know that it's always written about that Iran is winning in Syria, but if indeed wh whatever happens, it will be a pirate victory because they've lost uh, tremendous popular support um, uh, throughout the Sunni Arab world. I'm going to keep us on the nature of the conflict for one more question, but then uh, really move into those uh, contemporary political challenges. Both countries of Iran and Saudi Arabia have very high stakes domestic political uh, competitions going on. And I think, uh, Bernie, you mentioned that there's a hijacking of the sectarian uh, symbolism narrative to try to further politics. Could you both say a word, and I'll start with you, Kareem, about how the domestic political challenges, in your case in Iran, are influencing this competition with Saudi Arabia and then vice versa? So I think that Iran is now in the 37th year of the, the revolution, 1979 revolution. And I think what President Rouhani is trying to do is to start to put the countries national interests, economic interests before revolutionary ideology. And what's interesting here is that I think for many Iranians, they would argue that a better relationship with the United States is in the country's national interests. You know, if you want to improve your economy, your slogan can't be death to America. You know, you have to have commercial relations with the um, best economy in the world. And likewise, saying death to Israel constantly when they're, um, you know, you don't have any direct land or border disputes with Israel doesn't make a lot of sense. And therefore, I think the, the Saudi, I mean, the, the rivalry with Saudi Arabia and the opposition to ISIS and Wahhabi Islam, um, I would argue is something that both 
you know, nationalist Iranians, even if they're totally secular and don't like the Islamic Republic, they, they agree with that, they, they would support that, and the Islamic Republic could support. So, so I think that, um, you know, for, for, for the pragmatists in Tehran, trying to swap um, Saudi Arabia, Wahhabis, ISIS for uh, Israel and the United States as enemy number one um, could be something which the public could eventually rally around. It's not going to happen overnight, but, but I can see five, ten years from now that may be taking place. So just um, somewhat putting words in your mouth, but I think saying very much what you, you just said, um, if it's Iran who wants the ideological challenge, not the sectarian challenge, and Iran has had this deal with the United States, it makes it a lot more difficult to keep up that part of the ideology. So they need to ratchet up the anti-Saudi rhetoric? Is that what you're saying? That's part of what's happening here? Well, I should clarify that um, as long as this current Supreme Leader remains in power, he's 76 years old, um, mullahs have pretty long, li longer than average like lifespans. Like the Castros. Yeah. Um, I think that he's not going to change his worldview, so that you know, hostility towards the US, toward, toward Israel will remain. Um, but I think that if we look on the horizon, and it may be a long time, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, but as Iran starts to become more of a nation rather than a cause, as Henry Kissinger put it, right. um, I think that the rivalry with Saudi Arabia and competition with, uh, with Saudi Arabia makes more sense in the context of Iran's national interests rather than death to America, death to Israel, which is an interest of the Islamic Republic, but I wouldn't argue it's an Iranian national interest. Okay, thank you. Bernard, could you say a little bit about the domestic politics in Saudi Arabia and how this is affecting things? I heard some people after the execution of Sheikh Nimra saying, oh, this was done, executing this very senior high-profile Shia cleric because it was trying to distract, Saudi Arabia was trying to distract the world and its people from domestic problems. Do you think there's validity to that or not necessarily? No, I, I really, I don't, I don't buy that argument. You have to remember that when Saudi Arabia in January, I think it was January 2nd, executed Nimr and Nimr and I, three other Shiites, mm -hmm. th there were 43 other Sunnis who right. were also executed, who, many of whom were serious ISIS. ideologues of, mainly Al-Qaeda actually, but okay. ISIS uh, had adopted some of them. Um, you know, to kill that many Sunnis uh, and, and not to kill or not to execute Shiites who were also advocating violence and advocating the toppling of the regime. And after all, Nimr and Nimr was captured in a gunfight um, with armed men with him. Uh, firstly, it would have sent a, a strange message to your own population. Uh, and I, I think this actually brings out something very important, which is that the Saudi monarchy, you know, we think of it as authoritarian, uh, and it is. But it is actually responsive to its people, it has, it has to be. It's aware of what's going on uh, domestically. And the domestic population is, um, I mean, I don't know if irate, apoplectic about what's going on in both Iraq and in Syria. I mean, the, the daily brutality against Sunnis in Syria, in particular where you have starvation and in uh, towns that are actually being encircled by Hezbollah and Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps commanders, I mean, this is something that plays very badly in, in the kingdom, and there's a lot of pressure on the leadership to do something about it. Um, so the, the Saudi leaders are having to respond to that pressure. Um, at the and, and of course, they see Iran as behind what's going on in Syria um, and, and what's going on also in Iraq. So that's one, that's one pressure that comes in from the domestic uh, aspect of society. The other is that the Saudi leadership is talking that there are economic problems, I mean, very serious economic mm -hmm. problems domestically, and that they have to diversify their economy and they have to change the nature of the deal that they have with their own population. The whole system of entitlements is right. going to have to be renegotiated. And that has to do with oil and the price of oil, because we are at a moment when oil has gone down by 70% in its price, and this is creating tremendous pressure uh, domestically, but it's also creating pressure in Iran. And so there's this other aspect of the competition with Iran that has to do with oil and the price of oil. Uh, and that's one that we should not ignore. Great, let's talk about that for, for a moment, uh, not only because it's one of my main interests, uh, but getting to this, the effects of the competition. So actually when I was in Saudi Arabia just uh, 10 days or so ago, there was this announcement of this 
potential deal between uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Qatar, and Venezuela to rein in production. And there was some you know, talk about maybe the Iranians would come on board or not. Uh, to what extent could this economic pressure um, actually lead these two countries to overcome their political differences? I'm skeptical, but I want the two of you to convince me if you feel otherwise. Kareem, I'll start with you. Well, I just don't think Iran is about to cut production. I mean, they're finally coming in out of the cold after, after 10 years, so I see very little likelihood that they're about to um, agree to a, a freeze or a production cut. Um, but what, what about the yeah. larger question? Could economic pressures on both of these regimes bring them closer together where they're so politically far apart? Or are politics always going to be dominant over economic issues? I would love to be able to answer affirmatively and say economic, uh, you know, economic uh, need will, will bring about some type of a political modus vivendi, but it just seems, and I would be curious to get Bernie's take, that the, the hatred right now is just so deep as these regional conflicts continue to rage that absent, especially in Syria, absent in, in Yemen, absent some type of a, of a de-escalation in those conflicts, I think it's very unlikely you see any um, real economic cooperation between the sides, and, and frankly, I think you could see some acts of economic sabotage, whether that's, you know, Iran um, um, was, was, was effective in hacking uh, Saudi Aramco um, uh, right. using uh, uh, cyber activities. And, um, you know, the, what, what, what is interesting about Iran and Saudi Arabia is that the oil reserves of Saudi Arabia are, are in the predominantly Shia part of the country, and the oil reserves of Iran are not all of them, but, but, but some key ones are in a, a Sunni uh, a part of the country, Khuzestan. Okay. It, yeah. Do, the, do you agree with Karim in yeah, terms I, I of don't the think, diagnosis? Well, for, firstly, I, I don't see the Saudis as being as desperate as the Iranians economically. Yeah. So the Saudis, you know, have 600 billion plus in, in, in cash reserves. Uh, they can still borrow domestically. They can borrow internationally. They can, there's a lot that they can do. Um, so the pressure is not there for another three to five years, at least. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that the Saudis realize is that there is a surplus of production in the global economy today of, of, of oil, and that at, you know, we, the world consumes about 95 million barrels of oil a day. And if the Saudis were to cut their own production in, w with the idea of increasing the price, right. actually the Iranian production would, and the Iraqi production and other production, shale for US, instance, maybe. yeah, would, would make up for that loss. And so the price would in fact not go up. And so why should the Saudis take a hit and, and help Iranians sell more oil? They're not gonna do that. Yeah. Uh, and they're certainly not stupid. I mean, the, the technocrats in Aramco and the technocrats in the oil, in the oil uh, ministry in Saudi Arabia, I mean, have internalized lessons of, from the oil industry for decades now. Right. And they really know what they're doing. Yeah, for what it's worth, my interpretation of that deal uh, or that proposal was really that it wasn't about economics, but it was about geopolitics in the sense that Saudi took a lot of pleasure in lining up Russia and Venezuela to confront Iran, to sort of shift the blame from the low oil prices from Saudi Arabia to Iran. If Iran would only agree to this proposal, then the market would stabilize. Um, so I thought it was quite a clever geopolitical spin on their part. Um, let's talk about what the implications of this rivalry are for um, just the overall situation in the region and particularly for outside powers. Are outside powers able, and I'm thinking specifically of Russia, able to exploit this rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Russia to establish a foothold? How has Russia really um, been a, a beneficiary or, or um, otherwise of this rivalry? Awesome. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, the Russians have um, taken advantage of the situation in Syria, but, you know, it, they basically came in to save Assad's skin because it looked very much like he was going to lose uh, and have now, as it were, you know, they have skin in the game um, in order to preserve that regime. Um, they're, from the Saudi perspective, the Russians and the, and the Iranians, as far as politics, uh, is concerned are very much on the same page and you know they're one camp uh, because they are in favor of keeping Assad in power. 
Um, so I don't, I, I don't see, uh, at, le at least the Saudis, thinking of the Russians and the Iranians as, as different. Um, and I think this, the Russians got involved not so much because of the rivalry between Iran and, and Saudi Arabia, but rather because uh, the United States gave them an opening, mm -hmm. gave the Russians an opening in Syria in particular, um, and, didn't, and didn't stop, uh, didn't do what needed doing, especially once the chemical weapons were used uh, by, by the Assad regime. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Kree? Well, I have, uh, I'll say something about the Iran Russia relationship because I have a very um, cynical understanding of Russian interests. Uh, the, the P5 plus one that negotiated the deal with uh, um, Iran is the um, you know, Russia, China, the United States, France, Germany, UK. I think five of those countries apart from Russia are, are actually, um, it's, it's in their interest to see Iran emerge from economic isolation and in their interest to see a more kind of pragmatic, moderate Iran uh, uh, um, eventually emerge. And I would put the United States in that category as well. Um, but I don't think that serves Russian interest. I think for a variety of reasons. One, um, you know, Ru Iran is the second largest natural gas reserves after Russia. Um, hasn't been able to exploit those natural gas reserves because of sanctions, domestic mismanagement, et cetera. So the last thing that uh, Russia wants is an Iran which has emerged from uh, the cold, acquired LNG technology and can start to compete with Russia and global European gas markets. Uh, two, I think that there is a Russian understanding of the fact that um, you know there's a million Iranians living in the United States, probably some in this room tonight. There's probably hundreds of Iranians that choose to go and live in Russia. It's not a, a country, I would argue that it's probably one of the least popular countries um, um, uh, from a popular perspective in Iran. So the day when Iran starts to put its, its national interest before revolutionary ideology, I think um, you'll start to see a, a much, um, uh, the, 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 the alliance that currently exists right now between Russia and Iran uh, won't make as much uh, sense. And, and I think that Russia has benefited a lot from Iranian oil being off the market and the risk premium of oil, Iranian um, oil being, the risk premium of oil prices remaining high because of the unresolved nuclear issue with Iran. So for a variety of reasons, I, I think it doesn't serve um, Russia's interest to see an Iran which has emerged and is no longer um, suffering as a result of its own self-inflicted um, uh, problems. and. Um, so for that reason, I think they continue to play the United States and, and Iran off of one another. Um, and they will continue to, to, to try to, be, uh, to, 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 to show Iran that they are a strategic, if not a, a tactical ally. Okay. I'm going to ask uh, two quick questions before we go to the audience. So start thinking about uh, those of you who would like to get up and uh, pose a question to our guests. Um, first, just on Syria. We've talked a, a little bit about Syria, but to what extent does this rivalry between Iran and Syria, I mean, Iran and Saudi Arabia, does it, does it preclude a solution to the Syrian conflict? I mean, is it required that these two countries need to come together more before Syria can improve? Or is it possible that there's some sort of uh, amelioration of the Syrian situation that will have a positive effect on the relationship? Which way does the arrow go? Kareem, I'll start with you and then okay, go to Okay, well, uh, as I said, I, I don't think the Iran-Saudi rivalry caused the Syrian uprising, right? right? The Syrian uprising happened for the same, similar reasons that the Tunisian and Egyptian and Yemeni uprising was a young population rising up against the corruption of an individual and his family. So that dynamic uh, existed. At the same time, at this point, it's difficult to see how the conflict is resolved, absent some type of a, um, some type of um, understanding between the two sides. You know, we're now in the fifth year of this conflict. Um, Iran, for the for the last five years, I've heard people say, "Well, Iran is really, you know, they're they're, they're tired of supporting Assad. They're tired of this conflict." and and they continue, and they've now poured billions of dollars into this conflict. And I think that they feel that they're winning. Um, that Assad is, is, the trend lines are looking good for him. He's regained lost land. 
And in the perception of many around the world, including in Washington, I think there's a feeling that as bad as Assad is, the alternative to him could be worse. And so I don't feel like they're going to cut him loose anytime soon. And I don't think the Saudis are going to content themselves with, um, with, with Assad remaining in power. So I'd be curious to hear what Bernie says. Yeah, I, I, I agree in, in, in that um, I think that the Saudis and the, and the Iranians see Syria as a zero-sum mm. uh, competition. Uh, you know, Iran has not only poured billions, but it's also uh, sent the cream of its, uh, uh, of its non-state actor uh, troops into this battle. I mean, Hezbollah has lost hundreds, if not more, men. In this, and these are, these are well-trained, you know, fighters. expensive fighters uh, who were there to fight Israel, not to fight in Syria. Uh, so they're all in, uh, the Iranians. And I think the Saudis are also all in. I mean, many Saudi interlocutors that I uh, talk to say, look, if we don't stop Iran in Syria, the fighting is going to be in Saudi Arabia. So they, they see this as, a, as, as not the e an end of, 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 a, of a you know, set of conflicts, but rather the beginning of something that can get much worse. And you can see this tension um, escalating. Now, the United States actually tried to build a small momentum between Saudi Arabia and Iran by, uh, coming, by attempting an agreement in Lebanon on a new president, new prime minister. Right. Uh, the Saudis were game. They agreed on, uh, to this, uh, and the Americans were also in favor. The Iranians this, you know, uh, w would not go along. So from the Saudi perspective, the fact that something as small as a deal in Lebanon could not be uh, you know, achieved with the Iranians there's nothing that can be achieved in Syria. Clear, if depressing. Um, so again, I'm gonna ask people, if, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please, uh, there are four microphones. I'm just gonna ask our guests while people are lining up. Um, put on your American policymaker hats. What should the American stance be regarding these two countries? Does America have a more natural partner or ally in this pair? Is it better for America to stay out of this completely? What's the right uh, stature for the U.S. to take, Kareem? And then, Bernie, and we've got lots of people, so uh, I'll just ask you to be yeah, snappy. Sure. I mean, a lot of op-eds have been written that the United States needs to replace Iran, replace Saudi Arabia with Iran as, the, as America's um, chief ally in the Persian Gulf. Um, I think the reality is that Saudi Arabia's leaders want to remain allied with the United States, and Iran's leaders continue to chant death to America. So you can't force someone to be your ally if they're not interested in doing that. But I, you know, President Obama used the term equilibrium. He's been trying to bring about an equilibrium um, between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the United States. It's probably produced more disequilibrium than equilibrium. But I think like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you have to keep trying to, to bring about some type of uh, modus vivendi between the two countries. I wish there was a more hopeful Better parallel analogy, you yeah. could have used, yeah. but uh, Bernie, on, on this note? Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, as an, an American policymaker, I would try to get them to sit uh, at, a, at a table and try to achieve small, um, small agreements between them, if possible. I mean, the Lebanon case was, was you know, a good start, and they shouldn't just stop because of it. But looking at, this, uh, at, at these two countries, uh, as an American, I think that the Iranians have yet to decide whether they're a revolution, a cause, uh, or just a responsible country, uh, a state actor. I think Obama is betting on the fact that you know, this is a great empire with a great history and a wonderful kind of culture, and that they will be a normal country that's responsible and give up its revolutionary uh, credentials. I, I don't believe that that's going to happen. Now, now, looking at Saudi Arabia, there are two things about Saudi Arabia. And here, you know, one has to be totally unsentimental and without illusions. There are two things about Saudi Arabia that are fundamental from an American perspective. The first is that they are responsible stewards of their oil wealth. They have always understood the nature of the global economy and what, it, uh, what is needed in terms of being a major producer uh, in, in, that, in that economy of, of oil. You know, 10.5 million barrels is a huge amount. It's one out of every nine barrels that are produced every day. Uh, in as much as they are, you know, guarantors of uh, global economic stability, they are our allies. The second thing is that they've 
always been uh, a, a status quo power. They've been a power that has wanted stability over instability. Uh, they have, uh, in other words, they have been happy with, America, with the Pax Americana in the region. Uh, the Yemen war is where things are now, I see, changing mm -hmm. uh, in, in, that, in that equilibrium or in, in that way Saudi Arabia has behaved traditionally. So in as much as they're a status quo power, unlike Iran, they are also a natural ally of the United States. Great, thank you very much. Let's uh, turn to the audience. I think everyone knows the rules. Please introduce yourself um, and please ask a, a question uh, rather than make a, a long interjection or statement. And if we could keep things relatively short, that would be helpful. Chuck, I'll start with you. Uh, Chuck Kogan, uh, Kennedy School. Uh, we have in our minds the statistic that the Sunnis represent 85% of the uh, Muslim world, and therefore, how can they lose? But in the immediate region, the balance between the Shiites and the Sunnis is much more even. Uh, we haven't discussed much uh, about the contrast between Persians and Arabs. I wonder if you could talk about this dimension a little bit. Great, thank you. Uh, Kareem, maybe to you. Um, let me um, try to briefly address um, two questions that books could be written about uh, both of them. Um, if you look at the conflicts in which they're fighting, uh, so in Iraq, Shiites have a demographic uh, advantage. In Bahrain, Shiites have a demographic advantage. Uh, in Lebanon, they have a demographic advantage. Uh, in Syria, they don't. So. And in several of the conflicts in which they're fighting, um, the numbers do stack up for Iran. Um, but I think that Iran, uh, its goal is not to just be, um, you know, it sees itself as, as the vanguard of the, of the entire Muslim world. Um, it wants to be, um, uh, 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 you know, in this competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia. I won't use the word hegemony, but for, for regional power and influence, it wants to be able to transcend that Arab, Persian, Sunni, Shia sectarian divide. And I think that um, in some of these conflicts, especially the Syrian ones, as I mentioned, that they, they, they're doing well in their hard power, but they've lost tremendous amounts in terms of soft power. The Persian um, Arab, and in, in, in particular, you have to talk about the Persian Gulf Arab um, divide. Um, you know, I think that Persian nationalism, Iranian nationalism, um, has been a double-edged sword. I mean, if you look at today's Middle East, you have many um, countries which are, are totally unraveling, and that national identity is unraveling. You know, what does it mean to be Syrian nowadays? What does it necessarily mean to be Lebanese, or what does it mean to be Yemeni? On the other hand, you have, I would argue, three, four countries, Iran, Egypt, uh, Turkey, Israel, that do have extremely strong um, national identities. But there's a wonderful quote, I think it's from Orwell, about um, the difference between patriotism and nationalism. And he said that um, you know, um, um, patriots are, are, are proud of their country for what it does, and nationalists are proud of their country no matter what it does. And in Iran, you really have a, a nationalism which runs the risk of getting in the, the, the country into, into trouble and, and, and overreaching. But um, Bernie knows Iran pretty well, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. If you count Egypt and, and Turkey, then the numbers really don't stack up that much in favor of, uh, of Shiites. In any case, I don't think that the populations or even the, country, the governments uh, are functioning as Shiites or as Sunnis. You know, th this is... Again, these, these sectarian terms are a cover that are instrumentalized when these governments want to use them for, for their purposes. I, I don't think that they, in and of themselves, uh, dictate policy or dictate strategy. Thank you. In the balcony there. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the conflict Could you in, please, uh, in from. Yourself? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, would you introduce yourself? Yes, Mahmoud, Mahmoud Kitabi, I'm with Admins Inc. Uh, Assad family has been in Syria since early 1973. 
and that is way before ISIS ever existed. So one cannot argue that Assad and his family is the reason for emergence of ISIS. The, the problem, the way I see it, is when Iraq, essentially Saddam Hussein was deposed, and the Iraq went from a Sunni column where opposing Iran came to an ally of Iran. And that exposed the Iranians to Saudis in a direct manner. Could you please um, just formulate a question for us? Right. So uh, then uh, if this is the problem, then as long as Iraq, it seems to me, is in the Shia column, this rivalry will exist. And Syria is just a manifestation. So the way that I see it is partition of both Syria and Iraq. What do you think that is a possibility? Great. To have a Sunni state in both Syria and Iraq. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Bernie, maybe I'll, I'll okay, pass I mean, that one uh, to you. What's the prospect yeah, uh, as partition as a solution right. for the conflict? Well, a Sunni state in Iraq and Syria would be landlocked, would have virtually no oil, uh, and would be you know, a, a state that has none of the resources to, 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 you know, to be economically viable. Uh, so that's a non-starter for the Sunnis. The reason, I mean, one of the principal reasons for the emergence of ISIS, putting aside the American invasion and the destruction of the Iraqi state, is that Sunnis in both Iraq and in Syria, but also in other countries of the Arab world, feel disenfranchised. They feel that they you know, have a right to rule, and they're being denied that right. And ISIS feeds off this sentiment of disenfranchisement. There are also other structural features. I mean, you, know, you have a demographic bubble, you have a history of brutal, brutal authoritarianism, you know, economic deprivation, uh, you know, the internet and expectations because of social media and the internet. So there are many other reasons and factors that feed into this phenomenon. But at its root cause, it is the sense of disenfranchisement. And until Sunnis are enfranchised, are given a sense of power over you know, their own uh, territory, Oh, ISIS or something like it will remain a feature of Middle Eastern politics. Uh, just uh, very briefly, that, you know, that famous quote, success has many fathers, but failure is an orphan. You know, no one wants to claim credit for ISIS as an orphan, but in fact, ISIS has many fathers. Uh, it's uh, you know, Iraq war, Syria war, um, Iranian activities, Wahhabi ideology, a lot of different factors. So it's, it's difficult to isolate something and say wasn't wasn't a factor. Thank you. Up here, please. Uh, I'm Aman Rizvi, uh, an undergraduate senior. And I wanted to ask about Iran's leadership a bit. Um, so we noticed in the transition from um, Ahmadinejad to Rouhani, a lot of changes in the way Iranian leaders interacted with the West and sort of the wider world. But I was wondering with regard to relation to Saudi and sort of Iran's regional policy, how much does it really matter who's in charge in Iran? Thank you. Um, I think it does, um, well, it matters who's leader, doesn't necessarily matter who's president. Uh, the example, best example of that was uh, during the eight years of Mohammed Khatami, uh, you had a president who was very um, progressive, certainly by Islamic Republic standards. His mantra was dialogue of civilizations, and yet Iran continued supporting Assad, Hezbollah continued supporting Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So it didn't change Iran's regional policies, many would argue that's the domain of, of the Revolutionary Guards. Um, I haven't seen tangible signs of uh, change in Iranian regional policies since Rouhani has become president, but um, I, I, I personally believe this is a phase for Iran, and its current regional policies aren't a reflection of a national interest, it's a reflection of Islamic Republic's uh, interests, and, and you know, countries go through these phases, but over time I think there will be uh, a correction. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hey, my name is Hania Mohammadi. I'm a graduate student in Kennedy School. Um, we talked about the internal incentives of both countries that cr 
caused basically this hard geopolitical conflict within these countries. I'm curious to hear about uh, the role of uh, other states, Western states, in in this conflict and how they incentivize by their policy these these two states to stay in these conflicts. What is the incentives outside these two countries? Uh, either. Um. I think that the United States, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, Karim, but my sense is that the United States really actually is quite as deeply uh, bothered by the fact that there are dip there's a diplomatic uh, breakdown and rupture between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, it makes life for the United States more complicated rather than less. Um, also, the United States uh, is involved in Yemen by arming the Saudis and also providing logistical and targeting support for the Saudis. And I think the Americans don't feel comfortable about that either. Uh, they feel that the uh, Saudi um, involvement in the war in Yemen is, is one that is um, going to, is a quagmire, frankly. It's a lot like fighting in Afghanistan. It's not something that, uh, it's not a winnable war. And it's creating a humanitarian catastrophe uh, that will redound to, uh, uh, and, and ultimately come back to haunt the United States because of its involvement with the Saudis in, in that war. So my sense, at least from the American perspective, that this is a really bad thing uh, that has happened. I would agree with that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, down here on the floor. Uh, Austin Federa, Public Radio International. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts tonight. Um, for the first time in a long time, we were able to actually send reporters to Tehran recently. Uh, they found it surprisingly secular, surprisingly pro-Western in terms of Western media integration into the country. Uh, even at these sort of famous death to America rallies, people were saying, well, we don't necessarily mean death to America as much as we don't like US foreign policy. Uh, and that's a very different experience than you get inside Saudi Arabia. How much do these shifting internal dialogues play moving forwards? And how much of that actually has an influence up to the governmental level on their relations with the United States or how that may change moving forwards? You know, I, I personally think that that dynamic you just described has existed for almost 20 years. Um, I was based in Tehran um, in the early 2000s, and I remember reading, you know, when, before I was even based there in the 90s, late 90s, all the news dispatches from Tehran were that, you know, the women's headscarves are going back, and, you know, the, if it's, it's, um, the mantle's getting shorter. Yeah, the mantle's getting shorter. I think it's, um, What's well, that old joke that in the, in the 1960s you could find far more communists in Paris than you could in Moscow? You know, if you if you uh, if people have lived under um, repressive theocracy for for a long time, they, in, in contrast to much of the Arab world, Iranians don't romanticize about joining mosque and state. They romanticize about separating the two. And and I, I certainly have noticed among reporters and tourists, almost invariably people who go to Iran. Uh, this will sound biased coming from me, but it seems that people invariably who go, go to Iran come back with a, a much more favorable impression than they did and very positive about Iranians. And it's often the opposite dynamic in, in Saudis. It's not often I hear people come back from Saudi Arabia and say, I really love Saudis. Um, so, um, but I don't think that's necessarily a new dynamic, and it hasn't changed the political realities between the countries. At some point, when both countries are ruled by leadership, which is perhaps more um, representative of, of popular views, you may say some shift, but uh, I'd be curious what Bernie says. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure about what you mean, you know, about journalists coming to Saudi Arabia. You know, you come to Saudi Arabia, um, you know, it's a fairly reserved place. Uh, it's not like you have a population as you do in Iran where at least two-thirds of the population is fairly pro-Western and, and is desperately you know, seeking to get rid of the mullahs as far as I, can, I, I, I understand it. In Saudi Arabia, um, you don't hear death to America, but you also don't you know, get the swarm embrace either because uh, there are differences, certainly, uh, cultural differences, uh, political differences. Um, uh, and, and, this, and, and, and to be honest and, and, and frank, I think the Saudis really have not been good at promoting themselves at all. I mean, they have a good story to tell, like, as I said, about how they steward their oil wealth and how they've been a status quo power. And they haven't been able to convey that to, the, to an American public 
in part also because their, their society is just radically different from ours in the way that gender relations, you know, um, especially on issues of gender. Thank you. Nabil. Hello, my name is Nabil Abu Atta. I'm a mid-career MPA student at Kennedy. My question is, uh, Megan, you alluded to uh, the, that this rivalry is seen positively in Israel. And I want maybe Bernie, can, if you can elaborate more on this undercover strategic alliance that's taking place right now. If it is happening, what details can we know about it from you? And Karim, if you can tell us when the Iranians can see this as a real existential threat, where they can take it as an excuse to escalate. Thank you. Thank you. Bernie, start with you. Right, so I mean, there are rumors and allegations that the Saudis and, and, and Israelis are meeting uh, and coordinating. If they are, I, I don't see uh, you know, the results of that, uh, of that at all in the region. Um, my, my sense of the Israelis is that there are two camps uh, in, in Israel, as far as all the events that are happening in the Arab world. One camp says, this is great, you know, we can sit down and relax while they hammer each other, you know, and they've forgotten about us, uh, and we can just do whatever we want to do to the Palestinians and so on. The other camp is of the view that this is an opportunity. Uh, and this is shared, by the way, by the security leaders, in, uh, you know, security service leaders in Israel, a lot of the military, and some of the left leaning intellectuals and, uh, and policy types. Uh, they see this as an opportunity to actually finally strike a deal with the Palestinians while the Arabs are busy killing each other. Uh, and then once the events of the Arab winter are over, Palestine will be off the table because it will have been resolved. Now that second group, the group that wants to resolve the Palestinian issue, is very much uh, you know, uh, on the losing side. I mean, certainly politically, the, the, the views in Israel have moved much more to the right, and no deal is uh, ever you know, contemplated with the Palestinians. Um, but I, I don't see any, I don't see any uh, you know, evidence of coordination in Syria, for instance, or in Egypt, uh, or Iraq uh, between the Israelis and, and, and the Saudis. Certainly they see eye to eye when it comes to Iran, uh, and we're both very much against the US uh, nuclear deal, but they could do nothing about it, despite all the influence that uh, Israel alleg allegedly has in this country. It couldn't stop it. Um, I mean, the question was, at one point, will Iran see these regional conflicts as an existential threat? Well, so, so many um, uh, rumors going around that they, there, are co there is some coordination and meeting. So when is, when is Iran gonna look at this and say the Saudis are actually? Are coordinating with Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think that, uh, poses and I, I, I don't see any tangible signs that Iran is feeling existential angst. There's that quote from Trotsky that while dictatorships rule, their collapse appears inconceivable and after they've fallen, their collapse appeared inevitable. At, at the moment, I, I feel like it's, it's not conceivable for me to think about this regime um, collapsing in the, in, the, in the coming years. You know, they. The, their economy was hemorrhaging on three fronts because of sanctions, the drop in oil prices, and Syria. Now that they've made the nuclear deal, um, um, I think that they will feel um, um, in, in the coming months and years a little bit less economic pressure. But I don't sense that externally, the biggest external threat was the United States. Um, I think that um, threat has been removed. President Obama has sent numerous letters to Ayatollah Khamenei saying that we're no longer in the business of uh, regime change. I don't feel like they, they feel that existential threat from, from the US, from Israel, from Saudi Arabia. And, and I would just add the final point, which is I've, I've read from others that argue that they feel an existential threat from ISIS. I think, if anything, ISIS has been good for the Islamic Republic. Um, there's, you know, we're talking about 30,000 Sunni guys in the middle of a desert. They don't pose an existential threat to a nation of 80 million, which is 90% Shiite. And they're going to be able to take down the Iranian government. And frankly, they make Assad look good, and they provided Iran a pretext to expand its influence in Iraq. So I think that ISIS has actually served Iranian uh, interests fairly well. Interesting. Right, thank you. Ali. 
Hi, my name is Ellie Wine. I'm a first year MPP student uh, at the Kennedy School. I wonder if you might say a little bit more about how elites in Iran and Saudi Arabia perceive some of the turbulence in countries around them. And in particular, how worried are the leaders in, in those two countries? How worried are they that the same source of pressures that coalesce to destabilize so many regimes unexpectedly in the, in the Arab Spring and over the, the past five years, how worried are they that similar sorts of pressures might ultimately de destabilize or even overthrow their regimes? Um, so I, I'll start yeah. by saying something about the Saudis. So you know, um, I think the Saudi population looks around and sees chaos in you know, parts of Egypt, certainly in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, and uh, doesn't want the same uh, to happen at home. Uh, so the, the uh, experience of the Arab Spring and then winter was uh, to really send shiver, uh, shiver down the spine of the population, saying, you know, we have too much to lose. We don't want this. Uh, so so the, the elites obviously are aware of this and capitalize on the sentiment. But also, you have to remember that the Saudi state is a very powerful state. Um, it has remarkable uh, abilities and capacities. One is the capacity to buy social peace through the system of entitlements that they have. They have a, a formidable uh, intelligence and security service in, uh, for domestic uh, uh, you know, coercive capacities, very, very uh, uh, significant and very professional. Um, and, and, and then you know, they have uh, the tool of religion, uh, that they can also mobilize. They have increasingly a sense of nationalism that they can also uh, deploy. So you know there are many, uh, many tools in their in their kit that they can uh, use to uh, maintain social peace. And so I don't think that the Saudi uh, Saudi leadership and the elites are worried about uh, about an Arab Spring like revolution. Uh, they do worry, however, that they won't be able to maintain their system of entitlements. Uh, and that, that, that's something that they have to address, especially if the price of oil remains low for a long period of time. Thank you. Well, Thank Ali you. was a brilliant former junior fellow at Carnegie, so I'm obliged to, to, to answer. Um, and in saying that, um, I, I think that the, the failure of the Arab Spring, I, I know that people say it's, it's not yet a fail, it's too soon to say, but, but certainly if you're sitting in Tehran or Shiraz and you look at your television set and you see what's happening in Syria or Yemen or, or even Egypt, I don't think you think to yourself, you know, I, I want that. Um, and so they already experienced 2009. They tried to rise up. They were, they were crushed in a short period of time. So my sound bite about the Orient society is that in 1979, they experienced a revolution without democracy, and today they aspire for a democracy without a revolution, um, which means a very incremental approach. And I think the leadership of the Islamic Republic understands that. And um, you know, for that reason, I think we should have very sober expectations about um, the, the pace of change in Iran. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, so over here, please. My name is Steven Snyder. I work at The World at WGBH. You talked about the Yemen war, and it's uh, been uh, often thought of as a proxy war between Iran and, uh, and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. I'd like you to uh, talk about how invested these two countries are in the Yemen war and how that affects their relationship with the United States, with whom they're both allied. Great question. Um, Bernie, we'll start with you, then go to Cree. Uh, did you mean that Iran is allied with the United States? Well, or? given the nuclear deal and, and oh. the relationship, which is yeah. improving. So um, my understanding of, of the Yemen situation is, is as follows. Uh, Iran is a latecomer to the game. It only beca became really active in the second half of the 2000s, really actually until about 2009, 2010. So it's a fairly latecomer. Um, the Houthis, who are a Shiite group, not, not like the Iranian Shiites, a different branch of Shiism, um, have uh, had a close relationship with Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon. Uh, they've trained with them. They've modeled some of their ideology after Hezbollah's ideology. Uh, but the Iranian involvement is largely about to, to do with propaganda. There may be some financial flows, not proven. Arms, I'm not sure of. I mean. The Saudis and others say that there have been shipments of weapons. The Yemen is the second uh, per capita, the second most armed 
country in the world uh, it, after the United States. Uh, th there are, um, I think, 60 million pieces of, wef uh, of you know, weapons in, 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 in Yemen for a population of about 30, so two, two guns per, per person. Um, and, and, uh, and the Yemenis also know how to fight. So my, my feeling is that the Saudis got involved in this war um, probably under the influence of the leadership in the United Arab Emirates, uh, thinking that this would be a quick and, and swift victory uh, through an air campaign, and, uh, and, and you know, have now gotten stuck, uh, wanting to replace the Houthis who are now in control of Sana'a with the uh, recognized president of Yemen, President Hadi, who actually is not popular and has no backing whatsoever. And most of the Saudi allies in, in Yemen uh, are divided between themselves. So you have um, a real problem in the country in that uh, the so-called Iranian-backed forces are much more uh, consolidated and, and allied with one another. And you have the opposition that is highly fragmented and backed by the Saudis. I, I don't see a, a quick exit for the Saudis, and I don't see a quick a solution for the Yemen civil war. Thanks. Kareem, do you uh, see Iranian involvement in Yemen as overstated? Um, it's, it's one of those um, issues that um, I think, to, to be very frank, as, as researchers, it's very difficult to know. I think these things are um, someone working uh, special ops at uh, CIA has much more insight on these types of things because Yemen has been rendered increasingly inaccessible. But I just say that it's not a core interest for Iran. It's never been a core interest for Iran. More, far more Iranians have probably visited Thailand than have visited uh, Yemen. And I, I hate to talk about things like this because we're talking about human beings, but you can see as if there was ever some type of a broader geopolitical deal Yemen would be low-hanging fruit for Iran. They'd say, okay, Saudi Arabia, lay off um, Syria. We keep Syria, we keep Iraq, um, and, and you know, Ye Yemen is a core interest for Saudi Arabia, and it seems to me, you know, that's why they, 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 um, they, uh, yeah, they, they needled because, because they could, and it's kind of a, a chit for them. Just the second Great. part of the question, which is, is how does this affect the United States and the relationship with uh, the two countries? Maybe just very quickly on that, because I've promised one more question. So do, well, do you have a I, I, two I, sentence? For, for How does it affect the yeah, United States? I, I can put it in two sentences. So for years. You seem to have a knack for yeah, sound bites. No, so. for, for years, America told Saudi Arabia that they need to be more proactive in handling their own security. Finally, Saudi Arabia has started to do that in Yemen. And the United States is very torn about what to do because it was perhaps better uh, when, when Saudi Arabia um, uh, wasn't proactive in, in pursuing their own security. Long sentences, yeah. but two, yeah. thank you. Uh, yes, in the valve. Hi, so my name is Charlotte. I'm a freshman at the college and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum. Um, and my question is more for Kareem. It's about the long-term stability of, of both nations, but primarily of Iran, because we keep hearing that the um, strategic interests of the Islamic Republic differ from the strategic interests of Iran on the whole, and both countries face uh, mounting problems going forward. Um, they'll become net importers of oil within the next 20, 30 years. Um, the populations are consuming uh, Western culture. They're seeing Western society from internet, from TV. Um, so do you see another sort of Arab Spring being realistic in the foreseeable future within Iran, even you know, a, a complete revolution the other way? And do you see similar kinds of things happening in Saudi Arabia? I think uh, we addressed that a little bit earlier. Um, if there's anything you'd like to add in, at, to that question that Charlotte asked, and uh, also if there's anything you'd like to say in closing. Uh, you want me to go first? Kareem, yeah. I'll take so, you these uprisings in Iran have been generational. There was a big student uprising in 1999, and then 10 years later there was a big student uprising, and there may be another one in 2019. Each young generation, I think, um, expresses that uh, anger and angst, but I, I just think that it's a lot easier to get people to go out and revolt and risk their lives 
if they believe in, in martyrdom and um, they believe in an afterlife. And, they, and if you're, it's not often that um, people who are striving for more, more tolerance and democracy and coexistence are willing to go out and kill or die for the cause. And, and for that reason, I, I just think that um, you'll see these periodic hiccups in Iran, but famous last words, I, I wouldn't predict um, another um, uprising uh, in, in, in Iran. And the, the, the last thing I'd leave, with you, leave you with, I was just reading a, a wonderful essay, rereading a wonderful essay on the plane from Isaiah Berlin um, about the, the hedgehog and the fox. And that's something, it's, uh, it's a wonderful read to both understand US politics and, and Middle East politics. And, and basically says that you know, the, the fox knows um, many things and the hedgehog knows one big thing. And um, you know, these leaders in the Middle East uh, uh, really know one big thing, which is to um, stay in power. They're very uh, effective at, at, at staying in power. Thank you, Kareem. Bernie, any well, last I mean, I, he could, I couldn't have said it more eloquently. And I think if there is one lesson that the Arab Spring has taught Arab populations and Middle Eastern populations in general, is that these states, if they want to stay in power, which they, they do, uh, very, you know, the, the price to pay for toppling them is too high, um, as we can see in Syria and Libya and elsewhere. Great. Well, um, I would have wanted us to end on a more upbeat note, but unfortunately, I think I'd be keeping us here for a very long time. Uh, thank you both for joining us tonight and sharing your insights and expertise. And please join me in thanking both our guests.